Hi class, welcome uh, to my lesson. So right now, we're going to discuss bias in experimental research in psychology. So uh, previously, we were able to discuss the, um, the group design, the sampling techniques, and now we're going to talk about bias. So we're actually leading towards the end of the discussions, especially in the lecture parts, because for your um, laboratory and your final examination in my class will be the experimental research. So what I'm just going to tell you uh, or to talk about right now, it is actually this one is the brief only on the biases in experimental or doing uh, experimental research. Please know that there are a lot of biases in, uh, in uh, different kinds of researches. But what I'm going to discuss is the ones that, very, that is very important in doing the uh, experimental research. So uh, now let's start. All right, so we're going to discuss the introduction, uh, define what is bias, the different types of bias, consequences of having a bias in your research, and how to address it, and also how to address it. All right, so now let's start with the introduction. So bias um, have a secret, uh, serious consequences um, on the results of your study specifically on the validity and um, uh, yes on the validity of your study so it is crucial that we understand how uh, how to handle it and how to control it I mean yeah control it like what I've mentioned and I keep on mentioning in our class we have to control the bias so right now we're going to identify those kind of biases so um, fortunately I believe a lot of you guys have already experienced research so you are familiar with biases already but in here I will be just to be more specific on that kind of biases and I'm, uh, what I'm just going to explain is the biases or the most common biases that is going on in experimental research so now let's define bias so when we say bias this is a systematic error that can occur during the research process this leads to inaccurate and misleading results so in here uh, biases can arise from different kinds of so sources like for example it can arise from the research design that you're using the selection of your participant and also from your measurement how you measure them so that's why i keep on saying um, that first uh, to control bias so jumping on to how to control it as first we have to understand what are our biases so in our class in our groupings uh, let's understand first what are our biases for example uh, do you th do we think that people who have high grades in class or who keeps cons uh, consistently getting high grades in class are the intelligent ones while the those who don't um, is not so let's look and check our what our biases are so like for example those who wear tattoos and those who don't so what are the things that we think about them so those are the kinds of biases that we can encounter but in experimental research I want you to know that um, biases in experimental research can either came from your uh, from uh, from your uh, design itself so if uh, so I, I, I've discussed uh, discussed at least two group designs last meeting we have the within group design and between group design so that's one thing that where biases can came can came from next is your participants your selection so last meeting i've also discussed to you the sampling techniques that we can um that we can use so um in there also the selection of your participants can um actually um uh, introduce biases so that's why i keep on saying that we have to do random sampling and the last one is your the measurement the measurement on how you measure your um your data so like for example uh, that's why I keep on saying um, to you guys whenever we are conducting consultation is that we have to check our uh, our our tools so for example I, um, um, we have to use standardized measurements or standardized um, questionnaires because those are unbiased questionnaires and if we're going to use that we have to check its validity reliability and the other standardization process just to ensure that no bias are present in the task itself so uh, biases um, can uh, appear in different situations. So in here, there's an example in here, though it's drug related. So we're in psychology, but let me just read this. So let's say we're conducting a study on the effectiveness of a new drug for treating, for treating a particular condition. If we only recruit participants who have mild symptoms, we might overestimate the drug effectiveness because it's easier for people with milder symptoms to recover. This is an example of selection bias, where the way we choose our participants affects the outcome of the study. 
So um, this example is um, a selection bias because in here, the uh, participants just chose the um, individuals who has mild symptoms of the um, of the condition. So tendency that the drug may appear to be more effective than those who are actually experiencing severe symptoms. So it's the same with our class. So that's why I keep on saying to you that you just have to do random sampling and to uh, prohibit prohibit biases and also you have to make sure that your control group and your experimental group has equal uh, is um, even and also equal so that means to say their gender is equal at least their capability is equal um, you have ran randomized them their number is equal and such and such okay so in, um, an example in this one is selection bias because you just intend to just chose participants that have milder symptoms so for uh, whatever your your um your uh what they call this your topic your chosen topic in our class you have to make sure that there are no biases in selection so that doesn't mean that he or she is your friend that's okay you have to check also if that person would be an a bias in the future like for example since he or she is your friend he or she will just answer on a lenient note so that we would have a very good effective result so that's another thing so uh, that is um, an example of a bias so there are different types of biases so uh, this have been mentioned a while ago we have the selection bias and then so on um, but let's go first with the selection bias in here this occurs when participants are not randomly assigned to groups which can result in different be uh, between the groups that affect the outcome of the study so that's why I've mentioned a while ago that we have to randomize them I have gave you um series of examples of how we are going to randomize um, our participants right we have the um, we have the draw lots the odd and even the uh, spin the wheel we have a lot right now so we have to get all of our sa sample first and we're going to randomize them and then we have to make sure that the control group and the experimental group have at least same um, same um, characteristics uh, the control group have the same characteristics of the experimental group and we have to make sure that everything is equal and so we have or we were able to control our selection bias so let me just read uh, on this one I'll, I believe this is uh, same with the other one so because they've used the drug as well so we have next is the measurement bias in here this is where the data is collected or measured is biased which can lead to inaccurate re results so let me uh, read the example so if, it's a study, uh, if a study on the effects of a new treatment relies on self-reported symptoms, participate, participants may exaggerate or downplay their symptoms based on their expectations on the treatment's uh, effectiveness. So in here, so um, when we say measurement bias is where the tendency of the client or, or our participants to, um, to answer or to give answers based on what the researchers wanted. To, uh, to have okay so that's one thing and um, okay let's go first with there with that one so that's why um, in my previous example it is prohibited for us to get participants uh, that because we're just friend with friends with them or or whatever because we have this measurement bias because they have the tendency to bias the results of the, the experiment so that's why I, um, I keep on saying as well to other uh, to other research groups that um, hey, if you're going to do uh, this research, um, it is right to give informed consent, but just give them the appropriate information that is needed. It has to, um, we should not say to them that they are the control group and they are the experimental group and then the control group will have this and then the experimental will have this. So just to prohibit, um, uh, prohibit this kind of um, uh, bias that wherein the participant will just answer according to what they want the researchers to to have from their group so um, that's why I keep on saying that let's at least limit um, we're not going to manipulate them or we're going uh, we're not going to uh, to not disclose everything but we're just going to make sure that um, uh, everything will not be biased okay so that's why um, I keep on saying to other groups that they have to just focus on giving sort of uh, some of information but not all, every information because um, after the experiment or the control group or the treatment itself was given um, there will be a debriefing and then in that debriefing 
the uh, the everything will be mentioned. So this is what has happened and many more. But in the beginning, it is very necessary and important for us to understand that giving all of the information would would uh, or can lead to measurement bias. Okay, we also have publication publication bias, wherein uh, studies with positive results are more likely to be published than studies with negative results, which can lead to an overestimation of the effectiveness of a treatment or intervention. So, um, publication bias, I also relate this with the biases or the literature that we are actually getting. Like, for example, um, I ask you to do uh, chapter 2, and then there are literature there that keeps on saying that um, based on this kind of research, um, our research can actually lead to a good um, or a positive results giving, given that there is an effect and then um, and then some of the uh, groups or some of the students just focus on those kind of researches they do not give the negative aspect like for example um, according to um, like for example according to Lopez in 2004 there's a result um, and ha it shows a good effect on this kind of experiment um, and then they prohibit the other ones like for example they prohibit uh, these kinds of um, researches like for example according to um, Aquino in 2024 there um, there has no results or there is no significant effects of this variable to this variable however there's there is still room for improvement or another form of recommendation um, given and what whatsoever so um, to avoid publication bias and for to avoid for you to have this kind of biases as well in your mind I do suggest that you also read the other side of the coin so if you're focusing on having a result from your experiments or having an insignificant effect it is also important for you to check on the other side of the coin that there might be no significant effect so that's why um, in the publication bias as you can see only those um, who has a result has um, or a positive result has been published but th there's who has not uh, has not been published so th same thing with doing our research our, our RRL so please do read those who have significant effects and also those who don't have a significant effect and if you just read on both of both of them it will actually help you um, come up with um, with a, a strong um, um, hypothesis of having an alternative and a null hypothesis so if you're actually doing a research if you're doing the experiment itself while doing it you have to uh, have this neutral approach or neutral um, appro uh, yes neutral choice whether it has an effect or not so you have to have um, you it seems like you're blind that as if whatever happens there will have uh, that will be the result and also um, I want you to know that having a, a positive result or meaning to say having a good effect of your variables um, is a good result however having no effect as well is also a result and a good result and both of them are good researches as well as long as it's done um, in a very a scientific manner of course all right so what are the consequences of bias so, um, class, I want you to, to know that we have personal biases as well. I keep on giving this in our class. Like, for example, we have biases towards the physical attributes, biases towards one's performance in class, and um, in other aspects as well. Um, um, I want you to also um, notice that. And for you to notice that and for you to understand your biases, it is very important for you to talk to each other as a group and then tell them that this ha this can be... Uh, th that your perspective can bias the results if we do this and many more because they have they have these consequences so what are these consequences so it can lead to inaccurate results and can also mislead researches and further uh, this is the most important one it can harm the participants so um, like for example this one so a study of the effectiveness of a new drug may be biased in the selection of participants which this is was my example a while ago is not random if the drug is given only to people who are already healthy the results may show that the drug is ineffective when in fact it may not be this can lead to wasted resources in developing and marketing a drug that may not work as intended in addition bias can harm participants by exposing them to unnecessary risks or denying them access to potentially beneficial treatments. So in simple words, um, uh, your, your biases can, um, can actually hurt 
people okay it can harm them so whatever your result or whatever your research are i want you to check on your biases and then check on if that will lead to something that is being uh, results that you just manipulated or uh, it can or it can harm other people or many more okay so it can um sometimes it, most of the times it actually can harm psychologically your participants okay so i want you to be careful on your biases because um, that can lead to harm as well so how we're going to address the biases? so we have this blinding method that's this is what i'm trying to say a while ago if you are the researcher you have to have this neutral stand if possible you have to be blind okay but in experimental research we have this concept of blinding as well so what is blinding <coughs> excuse me so in here you're going to conceal information from participants or researchers to prevent them from being influenced by by their own biases so um one way is that we can um, um we can blind our participants or yeah first we have to blind we can blind our participants that they are either the control group or the experimental group that's one thing that we can actually address biases so um we can blind them not telling them that oh you're the control group oh you're the experimental group the next thing is that we can do is we're going to blind the researchers how we're going to do that so there's this one researcher or the lead researcher um you can tell that researcher okay you're going to be assigned in group one not knowing that they are the experimental group and then you're going to assign the set of people to group two not knowing that they're actually handling control group and then although the, the the instructions was clear of course it has to be clear on those both, both groups so they can uh, do the experiment as well all right so um uh, that's one thing okay so you can just blind the participants or you can blind the researchers or you can blind the both okay so you can blind both the participants and both the researchers and that was what we called the double blind study okay so um double blind study going deeper into that is uh, neither the participants nor the researchers know which group the participant belongs so for example if that would be the control group or the treatment group or experimental group so this will help prevent bias from affecting the results all right so um uh, in here none or anyone only the leader of the um the research is the one who actually knows what's going on all right so um that's how blinding occurs okay so in here you have of course uh, blinding is there but you have to make sure that everything in the process of doing the experiment should be standardized so for example you're in the control group the approach should be a standard or the same with the treatment group or experimental group so that's how blinding occurs so there would be a minimal or no biases at all so you can promise that there would be bias but it it would be minimal all right next one is i keep on saying this one is the randomization or just rule this random sampling in your participants so in here um you are randomly assigning participants to different groups um to the treatment group and also to the control group so this ensures that each group is similar in terms of potential confounding variables so confounding variables i've mentioned that before these are variables that we need to control or else it will affect the results of our experiment so this helps to reduce the influence of bias on the results so in here i keep on saying that we have different ways to do randomization we can do odd and even uh drawlets um a uh, fishbowl uh, not, not the fishbowl analysis <laughs> but the fishbowl where you're just going to use the fishbowl itself and then you're going to get the names of the the ones who's assigned in the control and then the treatment group or you can do the simple spin the wheel which is cheaper okay so randomization gives equal up uh, each participants equal chances um, to be chosen and to be included in the each of the uh, or e any of the groups so we also have peer review so in here uh, this is a third method that can be used to address bias in experimental research in here You're going to pull out or to go into um, have someone or an ex expert in the field to review uh, In the field to review the study design the methods the results to ensure that everything is valid and unbiased so this um, this is where you are going to get an expert for for example um, a thesis right uh, 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 research advisor then you're go they're going to just run through your um 
your chapters one to three or you're going they're going to check on how are you going to gather data and many more and then they're just gonna review everything and then they're going to give their inputs like for example um hey this um, sampling technique may not work for this one it may um introduce biases so um that's a peer review okay so you can tap on some professors just to ensure this one and they have to be valid and qualified to actually do the peer review so uh, this helps to increase the credibility of the study and reduce the potential for bias to affect the results so those are the biases and those are the things that um, we have to understand again bias can lead to inaccurate results wasted resources and it can also harm the participants there are different types of biases um, uh, and we have to ensure that we are going to eliminate them to um, ensure that we have or the results of our research is reliable and trustworthy so um, yeah so this uh it is important for researchers to prioritize transparency and rigor in their work and to actively seek out potential sources of biases this includes carefully designing the studies um, using appropriate statistical methods so for that you can actually just approach a peer reviewer and then you can just ask them um hey um uh, hi sir um is this a uh, hi sir or ma'am is this statistical method okay with our um, research and many more okay so um you can do that with an expert you can ask that so we can improve the quality of research and ultimately uh, advance our understanding of the world over around us so basically that's all for our lesson today that is biases so um if you have any questions please let me know you can just co comment in our dlc or you can just ask me questions in our chat messages so thank you very much class i'll see you in face to face i'll see you then bye